Okay, so I think everybody reads uh, the, the slides, right? Uh, okay, so I was, um, um, today we want uh, uh, to speak about uh, advanced functionalities uh, about SAT. So the point here is that SAT uh, uh, doesn't work only for satisfiability, but there are some extra functions that a SAT solver can do, which are very useful in many contexts. Um, substantially, one is uh, the fact that uh, you may, uh, in some situation, want to compute a SAT under assumption. We, I'll explain what does this mean. And uh, uh, on incremental SAT solving, mm -hmm. which is uh, quite... Can you hear? Can everybody can hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, please uh, um, uh, mute your mic when you are not uh, asking questions. Okay. Okay, so um, as I said, we are computing SAT, SAT on the assumption or incremental SAT solving. I'm um, explaining what I mean with that. Then building proofs on unsatisfiability. So when your SAT solver returns you a proof, then you may want, uh, returns you on SAT, you may want to also want a proof of that. Uh, Strictly related to building proofs, so there are the extraction of uh, unsat cores, so the subset, the possibly minimal subset of clauses which cause their satisfiability, just in case of uh, uh, unsat result, and uh, also the computation of crank implant interpolants, which are very, very popular in, uh, in model checking, and uh, also I'm going to explain what this means. And I will very, very briefly hint about uh, max sat, but very, very quickly. Okay. So let's start with computing with the SAT, SAT with the assumption, which is strictly related with incremental SAT solving. Okay, so um, very often, many SAT solvers, I would say most uh, SAT solvers, allows you to solve uh, um, a CNF formula. Again, we are always assuming that we are dealing with the CNF because we, we know that it's very easy to CNFize it. Uh, to solve a CNF formula under a set of assumption literals. So given uh, a set of uh, literals, L1, L2, uh, Ln, which we call assumptions, okay, well, or A1, A2, uh, AL, okay, uh, which are, of course, on variables which occur in the formula phi, we may want to ask the problem, uh, ask the solver to solve a phi under the, this set of assumption L1, Ln, okay? For the, from the purely logical perspective, so the input output perspective, this, is ex, this problem is equiv logically equivalent to solve uh, the satisfiability of phi and the conjunctions of those literals, okay? So assuming L1, Ln, then solve phi. Logically speaking, this problem is conceptually analogous to say SAT of phi and the conjunction of the literal. However, why you, we want that? Because typically it's useful to call the same formula under different assumptions, which may uh, trigger, uh, enable, or disable parts of the formula. So for instance, it may be the case that given a global set of assumptions, you invoke, you invoke uh, repeatedly the SAT solver uh, with under phi and uh, the sequence and uh, a subset of, uh, of, uh, of the assumption. So every time, so for instance, once you invoke your phi on a given set of assumption, then you invoke SAT of another given set of assumptions and so on and so forth. Why this is relevant? Okay. Okay, so how does this work? So this has many benefits, as we'll see. So in particular, to detect uh, uh, unsatisfiable, um, to diagnose, uh, uh, find diagnosis in case of unsat and also for incrementality. So what's the idea? So why this, how does this work? Well, the idea is, uh, uh, well, I, I assume you have understood how a CDCL SAT solver works. Okay. So the idea, when you invoke a SAT over uh, on formula phi under a set of assumption L1, Ln, 
uh, what you do is that uh, uh, you force the SAT solver to decide, okay? So the, to mark them, to put them on the, on the stack and to mark as, as a decision, okay? All the literal L1 to LN. And then immediately after that you have done it, you set, you decide that this the level zero is immediately below that. Okay? Well, just this is just a matter of setting a counter, right? So we know that the level zero is set <coughs> usually uh, at the level the union propagation that you, you know before doing any decision, right? And uh, and that's the important thing. If you remember from uh, the last class, uh, the two classes ago, when a form is unsatisfiable. Uh, so the unsatisfiability is detected when you jump up to level zero, okay? So when the most recent, uh, 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 most recent assigned literal in the conflict clause uh, belongs to level zero. So this means all the literals belong to level zero, okay? So when all the literal used in the, in the conflict clause allow you to jump to level zero, this means that uh, you cannot do anything more because you cannot, uh, this, all you have uh, is done. So you don't have any, any more chances. Uh, this again is uh, uh, standard behavior of uh, um, CDCL clauses. Okay, so you set the level zero immediately after those decisions and the unit propagations, of course. Okay. So what is the intuition here? And then, and then, like, and then you let the satsova run as usual. The point is the following. The, the satsova will run, will run, will run, will run. And at the end, uh, it may back jump when, or if I would say, well, of course, if it finds a solution that's uh, satisfiable, everything is satisfied, or great, you are done. But at the end, it may be the case that it big jumps to level zero with the close such that all the literals in the close belong to the sanctions. So, so the conflict set, so you run, you run the set solver, and when you jump in such a way that all the conflicts, all the, the elements of the, conflict, uh, of the conflict set belong to level zero, you know that we stop, right? Okay. So this is exactly as, as the solver works. But now it means that when it stops, this is uh, when, if uh, uh, you all the conflicts Remember, all the conflicts in ETA belong to the assumptions. Okay, this means that a subset of the assumption forces you by unit propagation a failure. Okay, are we there? You who are we there? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this means that uh, a subset of the you have found a subset of the assumption such that uh, after a few learning clause, blah, 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 they cause you to fail. Okay. So this means that this set of assumption plus the formula R leads you to, fall, to false, leads you to falsify a clause, which means, so, which means that uh, the formula is unsatisfiable. And this explains why SAT under assumption is the same that SAT and the beginning of, of the literals. Okay, so far? Okay, yes. Now, but they, but this, there is more than that. Okay, suppose you have adopted for simplicity, you can do also with other strategies, the decision strategy. So if, uh, Suppose that ETA contains only decisions. Okay. ETA tells you, okay, ETA tells you the set of uh, 
set of constraints, uh, that's a set of decisions, okay, which force you to fail together with phi. Okay. So substantially, it tell, it te uh, these techniques allows you to tell you the subset of uh, assumptions which cause you to fail because of the inconsistency. So if you have uh, 1,000 assumptions that you've done, right? Uh, you, you tell, uh, you mark a lot of, um, uh, you have a list of, a long list of assumptions, okay? And uh, then you run the set solver and this tells you eta, returns you a tooth assignment, uh, um, a con conflict eta, and it tells you, look, those assumptions, the subset of assumptions are such, so these assumptions are such that alone they cause you the failure. So this means that phi and eta is inconsistent. Are we there? So this trick uh, used based on the idea of, uh, of standard uh, back jumping and conflict analysis, okay, allows you to tell you among many, many, many distinct assumptions, which one causes you the inconsistency, right? Are we there? Uh, okay, I just uh, I have just a question. You sure? It's, uh, not always the case, uh, though, that uh, eta is a subset of the assumptions. I mean, if no, they are if, uh, not no, involved no, no, no. literals. No, no. When this happens, now of course you can jump to level zero with the other subset, and then you uh, no. Okay, think about that. Okay. All yes, the yes, level okay. zero is just the assumption. Yes, exactly. Possibly, possibly yeah. some other some other unit propagations, which are unit propagation under the assumption. Okay. Yeah. Everything which is not an assumption, and is not unit propagated after the assumption, is not level zero. Okay. Yeah, okay. So I want to say when we jump to level zero, mm -hmm. remember jumping to L to a given level, this means that all the literals on the conflict which has generated the, the jump are a smaller or equal than the level. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, remember? Okay. That's so right. if they are all smaller or equal than zero, the detail that <laughs> then right. obviously they means they are all zero, right? Okay. Of course, yeah. Are you there? Thank you very much. Are you there? Okay, Perfect. so, well, of course, if it contains some, some stuff which is below that level, you will not stop and go ahead until either find uh, satisfiable or jumps to level zero. When I say, when you jump to level zero, okay, assuming you have done a decision strategy, but you can, okay, this assumption here can be very simply overcome because when you have reached the level zero, also with the different strategy, say, first UAP, okay, only for this, at uh, this point, uh, you can uh, do a further uh, conflict analysis and uh, try a, a identify the region, the, the assumptions, okay? Only at the, so, I mean, when you get to level zero, okay, in order to identify this, uh, this time, uh, instead of, uh, uh, instead of a first UPI, can you go ahead uh, until uh, you identify all the all the original decisions? Isn't this clear? I see some faces quite perplexed. Okay, first, do you realize that if we have the decision strategy? then this will contain. So when you end up at level zero, there are all decisions, but since the, all the decision level zero are assumptions, then it will be a subset of assumption dot, okay? If you use the first, U, uh, um, uh, first UIP, for instance, you may have some, uh, some elements in the conflict which, is, which are not decisions. So for instance, are unit propagated 
are variable unipropagated uni at the L1 L LN. Okay? But once you have realized that you have jumped level zero, okay, bef and conclude, you can do one further step of conflict analysis and pass from computing the MPI, the first UIP, to, to compute the whole set of, uh, of decisions. Okay, you can do the, the resolutions, the final resolution step to find. Uh, apply the decision strategy. So to say, you apply the decision strategies only at the very last step you do. Okay? Only when you realize that the, your, this is the very last step. Okay? Is this clear? Guys, is this clear? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Yes. okay. Question, so, question. Okay. So why is this uh, of interest? This is of interest for two main reasons. It allows for uh, incremental reason, as we see, and it allows for what we see in extracting uh, unsatisfiable cores of the, of the fund. Well, first of all, this is in general useful, right? Because imagine that uh, um, a form, you have a bigger formula which contains lots of, uh, lots of important facts, and sometimes you use some factor, you use some pieces, you use some others, and uh, blah, 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 right? Rather than rewriting every time the formula, okay, the, taking the pieces of formula that are of interest for you, you have a bigger formula, and from you label every conjunct of interest with a, with a particular variable, and from time to time, and, and then each time you activate one or the other part. Okay. I will see, show you in the next slide. Okay, so suppose the selection, the, you can do uh, this to select some formula. So, okay, so all this has many applications. It can be used in many contexts. One is to select part of some formulas, okay? So consider the fact that you have a formula which is conjunction of clauses or CI can also be groups of clauses, right? Okay. You may introduce uh, some fresh variable, S, S1, Sn, which are called selection variables. Okay. Uh, and uh, you label the every clause or subset of the clause or subset of clauses, whatever, with this variable. Okay. So rather than the uh, beginning of CI, you have a big end of not SI or CI. Okay, so you take the clause where you want to activate, okay, and you add a, what is called a selection variable or activate, somebody also calls it activation variable, okay. And then you, you, may, you assume the variables every time you assume the variable of interest. Okay, what does it mean when you assume one of those variables? Okay, so when you invoke uh, this under assumption, the variable which, uh, remember this is equivalent to, to the end of the, of the, liter, uh, the, uh, the assumption and the formula. But when uh, the, those variables are assumed, uh, at the very first step uh, after assuming that, they will unipropagate the, the, this SCI and make active the clauses corresponding. Okay. So if, for instance, I assume S1, but I don't assume S2, okay, when uh, uh, the first run, A1, uh, so S1 will be unipropagated, so I will, and this will cause C1 to be isolated, okay? But C2, since I don't have, a, I don't assume a C2, then this clause here will be irrelevant as if it wasn't there because it's easy. So it's not constraining anything, right? Because it's sufficient to assign a SI to false and the CI is non, is irrelevant. Okay. So is as if those clo the clause C2 would not be there. 
So substantially, the, if you label some clauses in this way, so you give a name, a Boolean, so this corresponds to give a Boolean name to every clause, or you can have a different group of clauses with sharing the same, uh, the same variable CI, right? Or you can just label some uh, relevant clauses, some relevant group of clauses, okay? So what you do here is when you, the selecting some set of variable, you decide which part of the variable, which uh, clauses will be active in the formula and which other will not be active. Okay? Uh, so if I understood well, yeah. the function of the variables uh, SI is just only as a switches. Yeah, substantially having a, uh, S1, so the, uh, the variables, the list of activation variables switch on. So when uh, you have uh, AI in, uh, in the list of variables, it uh, switches on, makes uh, CI active. Okay. If uh, SI is not there, if SI is not there, it is as if uh, CI was not part of the, of the formula, right? Because there is a fresh variable which occurs in nothing else, nowhere else, and which is so. This means that this clause is not constrained because you cannot always make this formula true by setting aside to false, right? Okay, so in some sense, uh, the SAT solver is smart enough to realize this, and so we don't really have to explicitly assume that all the other uh, S uh, which are not in A have to be false. Yeah, 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 that's actually the point. So, I mean, this is simply unconstraining. So having a clause with one variable, which of course always only there, this means that you, you are free to, so every possible assignment to, to the element of CI is, is okay, is fine. Even the, every assignment which makes CI false uh, is, is fine because you can always assign a CI false and that's it. Yeah, okay, so the, the key point is substantial is that when uh, you, you do this, uh, adding the proper set of, uh, um, of a selection variables to the list, you activate parts of the formula. So you don't need to rewrite every time the piece of the same formula, okay, pieces of the same formula. Okay, so this time, so if so suppose you have a conjunction of uh, 1,000 of um, pieces, groups of clauses, right? And you say every time, well, uh, I uh, uh, sometimes I use this part, uh, this, uh, this subset of formula, sometimes I, will, I use this other set of the formula, sometimes I use these, uh, this other set of formula, okay? Well, you can every time uh, rewrite uh, the, the formula and, uh, and call uh, the sub solver with the, the, every time with different pieces, or simply take the big formula and uh, every time switch on and off some uh, of, the, of the pieces of the formula by just uh, adding some activating variable or not. Okay? Okay. Is this clear? So this is allows for selecting or activating only a subset of the clauses on fiat every call. Okay, so far? Mm -hmm. So why are these so interesting? Well, apart from that, that is a useful thing per se, but this has a very important application in incremental sub solver. It was the first way by which, uh, <coughs> by which uh, in to implement uh, um, incremental sub solver. This was proposed by Ian and Soleson in um, 2001, if I remember correctly. Okay, so I would say that many sub solvers, I would say most nowadays. Okay, so we have uh, the idea that the sub solver is something that in which you pass a formula and returns a sat dot. Then you pass another formula and returns sat dot. So something like a function, right? Input, output, input, output. Okay. In practice, substantially every SAT solver, well, most SAT solver nowadays, work as a stack of formula. 
<laughs> so working in incremental interface, but both by file and in particular by API. So the idea is that you can consider your formula rather than a formula, a monolithic formula, as a conjunction of subformulas. Let's say phi one, phi two, phi k. Okay. And you have a stack-based interface. So you push and pop formulas. Okay. And uh, the element in the list uh, should be considered as a conjunction. Okay. And then you incrementally check the satisfiability of big end of those formulas. So I add uh, phi one, push phi one, push phi two, check sat. Okay. Result. Push phi three, check sat. Pop, pop phi three, pop phi two, uh, push phi four and uh, phi five, sat check sat, and so on and so forth, okay? Right? What is the idea here? Well, first notice that this is the typical behavior in, in many applications, because when you typically you are exploring some branch, okay? Typically in model checking, uh, formal verification of software, planning, uh, and others, and every time you are exploring a partial branch, uh, checking whether the branch has some property equivalent uh, is used by invoking a such solver. Every time you add some element to, to the stack, okay, it's just you push some new formula there. Every time you backtrack, you pop some formula there. Okay, the formula encoding the piece of branch. This is very, very much used in many, many applications. In, in particular, in formal verification, but also in planning and um, many other situations. Okay, now let's make a step more. Suppose, uh, so the key point of incremental set solver that you don't want to restart from scratch the search every step. Okay, so imagine that I have a longer, a list of phi one, phi k elements, okay? I run and check and uh, I want uh, to say sat, okay? It returns sat, okay? Then I, I, I add fk plus one, okay? But if I add fk plus one uh, and I run sat, I don't want to recompute everything from scratch. In particular, and that's the key point, uh, I don't want to restart from scratch to recompute from scratch all the learned clauses that all the clauses that I learned in the previous steps. Okay. Now think about that. If you just if from a previous stack, a previous call, I've only added some extra formula. So if I just push it some new formula here, then I can reuse all the clauses I had, all the learned clauses I learned in previous code, right? Well, I just want you to recall one very important fact that all learned clauses in SAT are derived, are implied by, by clauses in the formula. Okay, remember, remember conflict analysis. The learn clause derives from a resolution proof, a resolution derivation from clauses which are in the formula, which are either for clauses which were already there from the beginning or which are learn clauses, which themselves derive from other deduction from other clauses. So at the end of the day, every learn clauses during the CDCL process derives by resolution uh, proof, uh, resolution derivation from original clauses, okay? Right? So remember that, so if you 
if you have a learn clauses from uh, coming from the end of AI, then if you add one more formula, then of course the learn clause will be still derived from the, the new formula, right? Because you just have added some more formula, okay? So in general, when you push, when you push some new formula, you can reuse all the clauses you have, you learn a clause you have used in the previous call, okay? Because they are all, they all derive from, the, they all derive from uh, uh, the same clauses. Okay, so far, please ask if you, if there is something which is unclear so far. No, no, it's okay for me. Okay, everything fine for me. So. What is the problem here? The problem is, right, is when you pop something, right? Because you have run uh, some formula here, okay? You have run uh, on uh, this conjunctional formula here, and you have learned some clauses, and then you pop 5K, for instance, okay? Now, in general, can you reuse all learned clauses when uh, you are running uh, on phi one and phi k much plan plus something else else the answer is of course no you cannot in general because it may be the case that some clause that you've learned is derived is derived from clauses in phi k which is no more there okay okay so here this is the trick by which you can solve this problem and use and use assumptions. So substantially, every rather than when you add those clauses here, instead of uh, adding phi one, phi two, pushing phi one, phi two, blah blah, you push not AI or phi i. With AI is a fresh selection variable. And you add AI to the list of assumptions. Okay. So instead of adding phi I, you add not AI or phi I, and you you push in the stack the new the new assumption AI. Okay, so what's the trick here? Suppose, okay, you have run uh, on uh, the formula. Okay, of course, running uh, the formula of uh, big end of uh, not AI or phi I under the assumption of one AK is the same of running on uh, big end of phi I as we have seen two slides ago, right? But with an important fact, uh if uh, so if we have run this if we have run this the clauses that we learn will contain <coughs> will contain the negated assumption because they are run on those clauses right so if uh, it will depend on a close label with not AI. So the, the here will have a close in the form of not AI or close. Okay. So the close of the resolution. Okay. Will will be not AI or something, which means that the close I will learn if uh, um, if uh, uh, the clause I learned depended on phi i will contain not AI. Okay. So I will learn clauses in the form not A1 or not A5 or not A3 or something else where all the nots are the labels, the indexes of the clauses which were necessary used by to deduce the learn clause okay 
Well, this is, those clauses are automatically activated until the assumption is there. But if I pop the assumption, I have a clause there. So suppose I have popped the IJ in AJ, and I have a clause which depended, learn a clause which depended on the, on uh, on uh, assumption uh, phi j. Then, since I pop the, since the assumption ij is no more in the list of assumption, this is a free variable. Okay, it's a free variable, so this clause is no more active. It's as if it weren't there. Okay, so in this way we solve the problem of keeping the. the so we um, this is a very nice and elegant trick uh, to keep track every learn clause a list of uh, the list of uh, a sum uh, of a formula by which every learn clause depended. So if a clause depend was derived if learn clause derived by pieces of formula phi 1, pieces of formula phi 3, and pieces of formula phi 10, then that clause will contain not a 1, or not a 3, or not a 10, plus something else, of course, okay? Which, of course, are immediately unipropagated if a 1, a 3, and a 10 are assumed, okay? So we can so if a1, a2, a3, and a10 are all in the assumptions, so it means I'm still considering those clauses. I haven't popped those, uh, I haven't popped those uh, um, uh, formula, great. But if I pop that assumption, that learn clause is ignored, is not of use because we will never use it. You never unipropagate anything of that. Okay, because this is a free variable. Okay, this is a free, so you is not constraining, right? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, in in the, in in your definition of incremental start solving, yeah. I, I think that uh, um, all the five. Uh, from phi one until phi k, they were known before you start the entire uh, showing okay, process. Okay, no, good question. Uh, not necessarily. Okay, so this is the simplest way of explaining this. Okay, so the first way, of, the simple way of explaining is: suppose you know a priori all the the formula that you have to do, then you can easily do this. So let me explain this in two steps. Okay, first, simpler case: you know a priori all phi one, phi two, phi k. Okay, so you add them a priori, you label them, and every time a push and pop uh, the uh, the um, labeling uh, boolean atoms. Okay, so this is the simplest way. The issue here, actually, you can also add the phi i's on fly because why? Because adding phi i's is not problem. The problem is popping. Okay, so even if you can decide a given moment to, to, so you can add the phi one, phi k, even in a second moment, okay? And you add not ai phi, not a k plus one, phi k or phi k plus one, okay? You can add it and introduce new, new fresh variable a k. Why you can do that? Because when you adding, uh, is is a safe is popping so pushing is safe is safe uh, popping is unsafe is potentially unsafe unless you you have those labeling trick okay so since uh, the problem here arises when you pop uh, so you uh, you when you add so you have solved this with the phi one uh, uh, with the beginning of uh, the i phi i with uh, a1 from 1 to k and you add uh, not uh, a k plus 1 or phi k plus 1 and you add a k plus 1 here 
there's no problem with that, right? Because we have pushed. Right? The key point is when you pop. Then by popping, you keep the formula there and you pop the variable here. Okay? When popping the variable, then uh, this this clause, this formula here will be ignored. Uh, now, oh, by the way, notice that if phi i is a conjunction of uh, clauses, this means that every clause, to every such clause, you 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 add uh, not a one or clause, right? You substitute every clause in phi i with not i, I or clause, right? Did I reply? Is this is the answer to your question? Well, not much. Uh, yes, thanks. Now the point here, okay. The first thing that you have to understand is the problem arises when popping, not when pushing. Okay, when pushing, a variable, a, a, a learn clause which was a learn clause from the previous formula. Is a, learn, is a valid learner clause also for a form in which you add uh, some conjoin, right? The reason is that if you, if a formula can be derived for for one to phi k, it can also be derived for for one phi k plus phi k plus one, right? Okay, so far. So the key point is this dependency, right? So learner clauses, are clauses which are derived by some resolution derivation, okay, from some clauses on the original formula, okay? When pushing, if a clause can be derived from a formula, it can also be derived from the formula plus something else, of course, right? Okay? So when pushing, this causes no problem. The problem is raised when you pop, because when you pop, uh, and you have a, a collection of uh, learner clauses, you don't know which of the learner clauses dependent on the part of the formula that you have popped, okay? And here is the trick, because if we use this trick, uh, the clause will contain negated literal inside, which correspond exactly to the closed, to the original clauses, or the group of original clauses from which they were derived, which are, acti which are activated by the list of uh, um, assertions, assumptions, sorry. Okay? So by, by popping, uh, so when uh, you pop, you, you have something there. So when you push, there's no problem. When you pop uh, with this trick here, you just pop the assumption. And if this clause here, if the learn, if uh, this learn clause here contains a literal which has been popped, then this literal, this learn clause is inactive. It is, from the logical viewpoint, it is as if it were on there, right? It just requires some little overhead here because you have to maintain the data structure of the clause, okay? But uh, it's completely inactive, okay? There's no problem, there's no, causes no possible conflict, okay? Because you can also always can make it true by assigning AI, AJ to false. Are we there? Did I answer to your question? Um, I'm really sorry, but I'm still a little confused. Okay, yeah, no because problem. understand it's not completely mm, easy. This is not easy. Well, yeah. Okay, try to clarify what's uh, what puzzles you. Um, we are solving uh, a um, we are solving a satisfiability problem, yeah. and the problem is made by a conjunction of uh, all the clauses. Yes. So if if so if we have we are fine trying to solve something which is okay phi i here can be seen as a groups of clauses okay yes 
but I don't see why uh, removing or popping something is difficult because you have a big uh, set of clauses. If, if the entire clauses are satisfiable, removing any of them is still, the rest is still satisfiable. No, 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 wait a moment. The idea here, okay, what's the intuition? It's not logically difficult, but the problem is that you, during the search of the previous call, you have learned some clauses, okay? And you have added some clauses to the formula. Remember learning, okay? Okay. Now, those clauses are learned because uh, they were entailed by the original formula, okay? So you can safely add to the formula, right? Remember to what I taught you uh, two classes ago, right? So the problem is not that is what can we do with the learner clause? Can we reduce reuse the learner clauses, or are we supposed to drop them all of them? The point is that since you may have a learner hundreds of thousands of learner clauses, you may want to reuse them as much as possible, right? Because it took you a big effort to learn, learn them and you, you don't want to redo this effort. Okay? The point is that some of those clauses shall be kept, can be kept and some other cannot. Okay? The reason why is that some of the clauses, so, Okay, so when you when you uh, just push one formula, then you can reuse all the previous clauses, learn, learn the clauses, right? Why? Because all the learn clauses are conceived, derived from phi1 and phi k. So this means that you also derive from phi1 and phi k plus something else. Okay, so far? Okay, sorry. Uh, so now I understood. Now I understood. understood. Okay, I repeat. Yeah. Now, when you pop, when you pop, in general, if you don't use this trick, you have a serious problem. Because if uh, you pop, say, phi k from here, and you have a long list of learn clauses, okay, you don't know anymore which clause depended on what, and which clause should be kept, and, sh and which one should be dropped. Right, because some of the clauses might depend on phi k, and since phi k is no more there, then we've been they should be dropped. Okay. Okay, so far. But the key point. So the key point is uh, instead of keeping a complicated data structure of marking which which. Uh, uh, close the learner close depended on which close original close, which would be very complicated and uh, hard to maintain. You have a logical solution to that, and this and the it's um, and it uses uh, increment um, uh, sat under assumptions. Okay, so instead when you add some new formula, instead of adding phi i, you add uh, not AI or phi i, where AI is a fresh variable. So a variable which is new, you never used it before. Okay. And you add, you add to the list, AI to the list. Okay. What does this mean? This means that all learned clauses will contain some variables uh, will contain uh, some uh, selection variable like not a one uh, or not a three or not a ten, okay? Where a, where phi one, phi three, and phi th um, phi, phi ten, where the group of clauses from which you derived the, this clause. Think, these are the original clauses. You have learned, so if you have learned a clause, it means that you have uh, 
this is the result of resolution of the of clauses like that. But since that A1 blah blah occur nowhere else, this means that those learn a clause contain contain those clauses, right? Okay. The, 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 they will contain all the uh, learner clause will contain all those literals, which are sort are sort of a marker of, of uh, the original clauses which cause this derivation the derivation of the learner clause. Okay, so far. When you pop, you you just pop the the selection variable from the list of activation, which makes this this clause, learner clause inactive. Okay, so you can is there, does nothing, and you are automatically guaranteed without uh, wondering which learner clause you want to drop or which you you don't want to drop. You simply, in this trick, you inactivate. Instead of dropping those clauses, you make you inactivate them. Okay, is this clear? Uh, yes, is it, yes. Is it clear now? Okay. So there is a little drawback of that. That after a while, you you have plenty of clauses of uh, formulas in this form which are completely useless. So from time to time, the SAP solver does some garbage collecting and drops the conjunct in the form of not AI or PHI such that uh, AI is no more in the list of the assumptions. Okay? From time to time, uh, some garbage collecting is performed. Okay? Okay, so is it clear? How incremental sub solve is performed? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Yes, yes. Fantastic. Okay, you understand that, that, that this is incredibly important in a huge amount of applications because very, very often <laughs> you don't have a big problem which is encoded to SAT and this is solved. But you incrementally did so you you add something solve if satisfied by you pop if uh, if unsatisfied by you pop if you satisfied by you push on a new modified add other pieces drop others and so typically this the typical behavior with that is when uh, you are exploring trees okay like in for instance verification planning uh, symbolic simulation and, and other in which every intermediate piece of branch is encoded to a sub formula and given it a given um, to a sub solver to feed, right? Here, every time you you span uh, the tree, you just push, 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 pop, push, solve, push, solve, pop, push, push, solve, push, push, solve, pop, 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 solve, and every time uh, you add the pieces which are tiny pieces, you add and drop uh, tiny pieces. So if you so you reuse a huge amount of search. With that, okay. So the you call the formula a SAT solver, which returns for instance SAT, and then you invoke uh, on a formula which in which you have dropped a little piece and added another little piece. Okay, you don't want to restart from scratch the search. You want to reuse uh, ninety-five percent of the clause that you have learned. You are learning in the previous code. Remember that using the learned clause, the most important ones, avoids you to regenerate. Okay, so cuts you the more piece of a search space which you have taken in order to generate them. Okay, is it clear? I will assume nobody objects, so I will assume yes. Yep. Is it still any any question leaving? Any left question about that? Any left question? Uh, I have a, a question. Yes, uh, please. Uh, if there's no need to solve uh, the same problem with different assumptions, uh, 
uh, when we simply solve a big problem by doing it incrementally? Uh, is this uh, some kind of uh, optimization? So when you say that if you don't, uh, you don't need a, a diploma, just push. Huh? Mm, yeah. Well, if if this you you don't need this, okay. If you just uh, build that incrementally, you just you can just uh, save the previous learner clause and that's it. Okay, okay. I see. But the that's typical that's use that. is that you still push and pop, push, 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 pop, push, 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 pop, push, push, pop. So you can uh, push pop a uh, tens of thousands of times. Like for implementation, right? So. This is something that uh, uh, is very much of use, in particular in um, model checking, symbolic simulation, uh, uh, formal verification software, and uh, other related uh, planning and other related problems. Okay. Is it clear now? Uh, uh, a small uh, a small question left. Yes. Since we have incremental set solving. Yeah. And also, we know that uh, like a bounded model tracking, if yeah. limited with uh, the Boolean cases, uh, we, we have a model tracking algorithm based on self solving. Yeah. Then the question is uh, why I never heard any incremental model checker based on incremental self solver. Are, are you kidding me? Incremental self solving was invented. Uh, I mean, incremental model checking. Model checking. It was in, so bound the model checking and came. Is that action. possible using an incremental SAT solver? Yes, they all bound all bound the model checker using incremental SAT solvers. I tell you more. Incremental SAT solving was in, invented immediately after bound the model checking. Maybe they don't say because it's implicit. But incremental sub solving was invented immediately after bounded model checking, actually because bounded model checking was a natural looking at bounded model checking. Well, sorry for those who don't know what bounded model checking is, but uh, because bounded model checking really implicit, well, uh, highlighted the fact that we needed. We needed it because in bounded model checking, you have exactly this situation. When you progress, we increase the bound K. Uh, typically, the difference between the step, the formula from step K to step K plus one, you just you pop a little part of the formula and push some other. If you look to the uh, formulation of uh, what is typically is used together with bounded model checking, which is K induction. K induction is typically the dual bundable checking. So you alternate a bundable checking step with a key induction step to prove the uh, uh, a property. That's typically, th that was exactly the place where um, incremental self solving was invented. In fact, it was invented by the same people. So here, the first incremental self solver. Uh, was invented by uh, Ian and Sorensen, who are the same guys who proposed about, uh, who proposed the uh, key induction. You, if you want, you can look. Uh, uh, I have some slides of, uh, of course, of uh, uh, model checking of uh, formal methods in uh, in my web page. There are some slides there. And this, uh, there is a whole chapter about SAT-based model checking. At the very end of that, that slides, so there is something which is called a key induction, okay? The explanation of key induction. And the, the very last slides describe the, the general algorithm and remarked the idea of incremental sort of solving. So that this uh, needed incremental sort of solving. Okay? Is okay now? Um, well, that's not. Uh, uh, well, I, what I wanted to ask is uh, if we uh, change a little the model by mm -hmm. adding one more uh, uh, constraint 
it yes. in the already established uh, uh, transition system. Mm -hmm. If we slightly change the model, yeah. then do we need to redo the entire model checking process, the, the BMC algorithm, or there's something we can reuse by doing the problem incrementally? Well, if this modification of the model means just you can if you can represent this by a stack based okay so the point is that if you are able to keep track of that okay so if uh, uh, your uh, transition relation is obtained by the previous one by just uh, by just uh, adding uh, some um, pu pushing and popping something and you have a run as a solver or then then uh, you uh, with the push and pop, you can run the SAT solver, and the SAT solver will benefit if the the changes are minor. Uh, will benefit from from lots of previous search. So it depends how you call the SAT solver. So the important point is that whenever you call SAT solver by just pushing something, popping something, and pushing something else, you reuse. Or the learner clo the clause that you learn, which were on the on the common uh, part of the form. Sorry, I cannot hear you anymore. Yeah, I think we lost him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello? Uh, we lost you we for lost, a moment. We lost you for yeah, exactly. I, we lost me. Oh, yeah. Quite strange. Oh, yeah, you are lagging, I guess. Sorry. I think you are lagging, or maybe your internet connection is unstable. Maybe my internet connection, because uh, uh, let's try to uh, stop sharing and. Uh, and then now it's fine. Sorry. Yeah. Now exactly. Yeah. Now, now it's fine. fine. So maybe I had yeah. some. Uh, uh, I had some problem with temporary problem with my internet connection. I don't know. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, please yes. tell me when I interrupt me immediately when you don't hear me anymore. Okay, so, however, is this incremental such solving clear to everybody now? Uh, yes. Okay, cool. Okay, let's pass to something different. Another important function, and what time is it? Um, another important function is uh, uh, bidding proofs. Okay, uh, you are, okay, so suppose your SAT solver tells you that the problem is on SAT. Do you trust your SAT solver? So, I mean, you want to know for many, many reasons why, why this was not satisfiable, okay? Remember that typically uh, an unsat call means that, uh, for instance, in formal verification typically an, an unsat uh, uh, so over the term SAT means that the property is verified, typically, okay? So you want to be sure this is the case. You want to check whether the, the uh, proof, so that whether your SAT solver is correct and they can understand why this is the case, okay? So there are plenty many reasons for that. So this is very easy, relatively easy to do by the SAT solver because if, if you think about that, what a SAT solver does is building resolution proofs of faults. So when, in the case of an SAT, it is a resolution proof of, of faults. Let me explain something. Recall that every, every time you generate a conflict clause, okay, you, you do that by producing a resolution proof, starting from the, the clause which was falsified every time uh, resolving against the clause uh, with, uh, which caused the unit propagation of the resolvent, and so on and so forth until some crit criteria is met. And then this clause here is learned, okay, so is added to the formula. Okay, those clauses here were either original clauses or clauses that themselves have been learned. Okay. Right, okay, so far. Well, there is obviously an easy way to track this resolution because if you can add the solver easily, uh, a log saying for all such a resolution that 
a long string that from uh, uh, close of index k to close of index i minus k, uh, we, uh, we derive the close uh, of index i minus k plus one. So every deduction can be marked as a triplet of indexes or, po or pointers, okay? So it's quite easy to keep track of these, all those, of these proofs, okay? Now, th if you think the very last step you do when uh, your such solver decides that the form is unsatisfiable is deducing false, okay? The very last conflict deduces false or deduces something which is a, a level one, but then you, you uh, resolved it against uh, a literal level one and this returns false, okay? Well, well, so, so this is the very last step it does. And at the very last step, uh, all those clauses here were either original clauses or clauses which were derived from original clauses and other level clauses and so on and so forth. So what you do is taking, starting from uh, the final resolution and wonder, okay, is this clause uh, original? Great, keep there. Is the clause derived? Yes, it's derived. Then I go for the proof, for the uh, piece of proof which generated this clause, and so on and so forth, until I produce a, a, a proof which contain which has only original clauses on uh, uh, as leaves. Okay, so. For instance, here, well, you have C1, well, we may wonder. So starting from the previous proof of, of the, the proof of unsatisfiability, the one with the false on the bottom, you repeat recursively. So for every learn leaf clause, you substitute the clause with the resolution proof generating it. Okay. And then now you see, okay, look at all those leaves. Uh, are they original or are they derived? If they are derived, well, I, I go, I add uh, further proof and so on and so forth until I obtain a resolution proof of unsatisfiability from original clauses. Okay. Notice that, uh, of course, uh, you try to avoid uh, writing write this as a tree. If you encounter some liter uh, whose uh, resolution you have already, some clause whose resolution you have already spanned, use on once. So this, this proof will be a DAG, not a tree, okay? So you build, you can build a resolution proof out of a SAT solver quite easily, quite naturally. You just have to keep track of the, uh, you, of the resolution step you do during conflict analysis, which tell you something in some way that modern such solver are, can be seen, they were not considered considered as such, but, but they can be seen as a particular strategy applied to the resolution, <coughs> to resolution, okay? Because you can think to a such solver as a, some tool which tries to build a resolution proof of unsatisfiability of a formula. And if and when it fails, generates a truth assignment. A model satisfying it. Okay, is this clear? Hello. Yep. Yes. Uh, Just a small question. Yeah. Um, we return unsatisfiability even uh, if uh, we turn back to level zero, uh, decision level zero, right? Yeah. In in that case, we. Uh, okay. Yeah. You. Okay. So what does it mean? What happens here? Well, <laughs> when, when you jump to level zero and you have a closer whose elements already are in level zero, uh, remember that uh, you uh, can uh, go ahead, okay, and resolve the close against uh, the literal level zero. So there is an immediate step more here. So if you, so if, uh, your sub solver stops because it has found uh, um, 
a clause whose literals have always been assigned at level zero. Okay. Well, you can consider this as a as a clause, uh, as a reduction, if you wish. Otherwise, you can go ahead resolving them against those literals. Okay. Okay. And so we will obtain for these are just minor variations uh, of implementation. Okay. Okay. You can, if you wish, uh, you can even consider a, a, you can even consider them. Uh, remember that level zero is just uh, stuff uh, which were unipropagated. There's no decision level zero. Okay. Okay, so you can resolve them. Okay. Okay. Fine. Cool. So, okay, so for instance, well, I don't want to go through that, but you can check that this is, if this is form, complicated formula is unsat because, uh, uh, because and it can be the resolution proof backward by, by this, uh, looking at that. You see every, every step here can be seen as a resolution. For instance, here you have B6 with the not B, B6 and you, you get A2 and not B4, okay? Okay, so the interesting part of uh, being able to find a resol uh, resolution proofs uh, is that not only resolution proofs are useful per se. Okay, so you do want to having a, a, a proof of what you have done. You know, a, a sort of a notice that is quite uh, it's quite easy to verify a resolution proof, right? Because you just have to check step by step. So although it may require an exponential amount of time to, to find a resolution proof, then checking the, checking the resolutions through the correctness of resolution proof is quite trivial, right? You just check every step, if every step is correct, and then check that all the leaves are part of the original formula. Okay, so checking your proof is very easy. It's very easy to build um, a tool which checks a resolution proof. Okay. And also there are formats which are able to encode uh, more, more compact way the resolution proof, but that's something which goes beyond uh, the interest of this course. Um, why is this interesting? Well, first of all, proofs are important per se, but also resolution proofs are the very basic component of two other important uh, objects that you want to derive. And the first one is unsat cores. And the second one we'll see in a um, few minutes is interpolants. Okay, so what's an unsat core? So suppose you have a formula, initially a formula, and then you find out that the formula is unsatisfiable, right? Well, very, very often in many applications, it may be very useful to find out the subset of uh, uh, clauses which actually close, causes their unsatisfiability. Okay, so it may be the case that uh, if a form is, is unsatisfiable, only a small subset of this formula, the, of this clause, causes their satisfiability, is unsatisfiable, right? Okay, and uh, in very many, many applications when uh, a SAT check can be an intermediate step, uh, in, you have hundreds of thousands of SAT calls, it's very, very often uh, you need also then starting the SAT calls, so trying to figure out what are the original set of clauses which cause a satisfiability and for instance drop all the others or whatever, or take a look at those, okay? Okay, there are, two main ways uh, which are used in literature to uh, find an asset core. One is to a proof-based approach, which was uh, 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 proposed by Sharak Malik, and uh, assumption-based, which was uh, uh, proposed by um, Inesh and, um, and, and Silva. Um, and there are many, many variations of that, but I give you just the basic principle by there. Well, one is trivial. This was noticed by Sharad Malik itself and so on. 
once you build a resolution proof of your formula, well, the leaves of your resolution proof is an asset call. It's a subset of your formula, which calls, which alone is inconsistent, right? So you run a set solver, you build a resolution proof, then you extract a resolution. You extract the leaves from this proof, and the leaves of a proof is a subset of the original formula, which are the subset of the original formula, who cause the deduction of faults. Okay? I think it's quite obvious, right? Uh, so this is, you can, you take this from free from the generation of a resolution proof. Um, notice that in general, these are not necessarily minimal because for instance, it may be the case that this clause here could be the use overall by a different subset of, of those formula using different. So notice that in general, uh, an asset core is not unique. Okay. And also a deduction. So you may then use uh, some clauses from different combinations. Okay. So maybe you can, you have a better way of, uh, you have a better uh, resolution which uses less clauses. Okay. So you can further refine the approach. Another technique is based on uh, uh, assumptions. And it's based on. Uh, sorry. Sorry, yes. Uh, about, about the last uh, argument. Yeah. Uh, I, maybe it's just a silly question. Why some subformulas were green and, and other are blue? Uh, they are, okay. The blue are the one of the unsat core, the green are the origin uh, of the others. Okay. So here are some not B0, B1, uh, for instance, is, where is it? I don't know. Uh, well, I don't remember. Okay. It's, uh, yes, in the this, first is, line. this is here, for instance, right? This is okay. here, okay. Yeah, so I mark in blue the asset core. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, assum a sat under assumption can be used also to extract the asset core. Uh, okay, with the, the, uh, the idea of the activation variable, selection variable. Okay, imagine that at the beginning, you, uh, every clause CI of your formula is substituted by not C SI or CI, such that SI is a selector variable, as we've seen in previous, uh, uh, in a few slides ago, right? Okay. Let's do exactly what we have done before. So, you assert you decide that the variable SI to true, and then set the level zero immediately after having assigned that. Okay. Well, so at the end, you do resolution, resolution, resolution. At the end, you this returns as SAT, and it returns as SAT, producing a conflict clause. on variables on level zero, okay, right? So you, you set variables on level zero, it means that the, the final conflict clause is, a, the neg is in the form of the negation of some SIs, SJs, right? Okay, go back to the, uh, where is it? Uh, okay. Eta, remember, eta, so the, the negation of the C, is the set of assumptions which cause the inconsistency. Okay. But since, okay, let me get back here. So this means that the clauses which were labeled by the selection variables in the final, uh, in the final uh, uh, conflict clause are exactly your unset core. 
right? Because they were the lead. So when you do resolution, so you start from here, you do bram, 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 bram. At the end of the day, you have found a resolution proof of faults starting from those. Okay. So when you do conflict analysis on that, bam, 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 backwards, you build up a formula, um, a conflict clause, which will contain at the end of the day, well, suppose that in the very last step, I use only decision, uh, we go back until all the decisions. Okay. Then we contain, <coughs> not SI, if, CI if this clause had a role in proving the inconsistency. Remember, this clause was activated by assi assi um, assuming SI, de deciding SI. But the decision of SI was considered to be a higher level than level zero. So in doing the conflict analysis, you stop. You don't resolve SI with the, this clause with SI. Okay, so at the end of the day, our clause, we will resolve away the CIs here because these are no more level zero. Okay, and at the end of the day, your final clause will all built on SIs where the SIs are all level zero. Okay, which means that SI are exactly all and only the labels of, the clo of those clauses which caused the inconsistency together with SI, of course. Notice that assume is SI, SI is resolved, uh, is unipropagated here and, uh, and uh, it causes CI. And then CI eventually will, uh, together with the other CIs, will cause the inconsistency. Okay, but then resolving back, you stop here, you resolve back this, and you have their size, the, the disjunction of a size. One for every CI which actually had a role in causing the consistency. So this is an easy way to have for free an answered call. Okay. So for instance, if you uh, get uh, this uh, formula here, for instance, you can add the selection variables. So you label with the fresh Boolean atom all the SIs, all the closes, and then you assert all the SIs, you assume all SIs, run the set solver. At the end of the day, suppose the conflict analysis returns you this close. Well, this close will give you all and only the blue line, the, the, the clauses, which are labeled with blue, which correspond to this sub formula of the original formula. Okay, so this is a way, an easy way to compute the SAT core. Okay, this was uh, uh, proposed by um, Inish and, uh, and Silva in 1990, well, I don't really remember, 2000 and something. I don't remember exactly when. 2006, I think. Okay. Now, then when you can, uh, when you can infer the improve, try to find a minimal, why? Well, with very many tricks uh, by, for instance, uh, looping, calling incremental every time trying to, once you have uh, found a first uh, sort core, you can try to drop some literals, one by some, some uh, sorry, some clauses one by one and see if this is still inconsistent, for instance, or use some by from, from binary search. So there are ways of improving this, but these are the two main techniques which are used to find the answer core. Any further question? I don't think this is particularly easy, particularly difficult once you have understood all the rest. So once you have understood all I've said so far, I think that proof extraction and uh, assert core extraction is very straightforward, isn't it? Okay, can I go ahead? Yes. Okay, cool. Okay, last topic. Uh, 
uh, of the day is uh, Craig interpolants. Why Craig? In, what is a Craig interpolant? Okay. Um, uh, suppose. Uh, uh, Okay, uh, let me first introduce this symbol here, saying uh, uh, so if X and Y are two Boolean formulae, saying that X is, well, let me call it all the symbol, uh, X is more equal than Y or whatever this means, is that the all the Boolean atoms of X are contained in the Boolean atoms of Y, okay? So the, the atoms of X uh, is, a, is a subset of atoms of Y. Okay, this is the meaning of this symbol. Let me define the definition of Craig interpolant. Craig is the name of the guy who proposed this. Whenever you have an ordered pair of, of a formula, A and B, such that A and B entails false, so that they are, their, con their uh, um, conjunction is, is inconsistent, a Craig interpolant is a formula which you call I such that A entails I. I and B is inconsistent and I is built on the common symbol variables of A and I. So the, the symbols of I are subset of the symbols of A and, and also subset of the symbol of B. Uh, this definition is very, very important. There's a huge amount of applications. So lots of, um, in particular, informal verification. So it was considered uh, considered already in logic, but uh, this is uh, uh, as a huge amount of applications, in particular in uh, informal verification. And what is the intuition of that? So substantially, uh, the interpolant you can see the interpolant as a new version of A. Okay, so notice it became so I, I is a sort of a restricted version of A because, well, it becomes, behaves like B in the sense that it is inconsistent with B, similar to A, and restricted to the common symbols from A on B. So substantially, you can think of uh, the interpolant as a formula representing uh, the relevant part of the models of A. So the relevant, the part of, of the models of A restricted to the common symbols, which are relevant to cause the inconsistency with B. Okay. Importantly, notice that I contains much less variables than A. So in many applications, you, when you have that uh, A and B is false for some reason, you may want to substitute A with some formula of much less variables so only on the variables which are in common with B. Okay. Uh, such that I in, still entails B. And of course, the point is that this formula is, is entailed by A, right? So I is entailed by, I, by A and uh, I and B are still mutually inconsistent. You may think uh, an alternative way is to uh, think about the role of not B, of the negation of B. This say that A entails not B. Do you agree? This is the same as saying that A entails not B, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, you you want to find an intermediate formula in B. So if A entails not B, you want to find an intermediate formula between A and not B, such that A entails I and I entails not B. Okay. 
and B and I contains only the common symbols. So in the deduction which caused, which passed from A to deduce not B, you want to find an intermediate formula which contains only the relevant symbols, only the symbols which are relevant for I, for B, okay? So that's the intuition of uh, why computing this isn't. So what is the interesting part here is that typically I contains much, much, much less variables than A. So in the future, I want in the next step, uh, I would like to substitute A with I, which is much smaller to handle and has and still preserves B. Okay. So for instance, in many situation, A is uh, the behavior of a machine and B is uh, the negation of the property that you want to verify. Okay, and you have found that A and B uh, is inconsistent, but B contains much, much less variables than A. Okay, and you want to find what is the relevant part, what are the, the projection of the variable of interest that you can substitute for A. Okay, so given the intuition, how can we solve it? Okay, let me say something that in general, the definition of Craig impair product is not something related only to Boolean logic. It's a much more, more general definition of what may involves many, many other logic, much more sophisticated than Boolean one. This is the restriction to Boolean logic. And in fact, uh, uh, there was a, a general algorithm uh, due to Pudlak, uh, which uh, from which we can build a, an interpolant from a resolution um, a resolution proof of unsatisfiability of A and B. So suppose you have A and B is unsat, you build a resolution proof of unsatisfiability, for instance, running a sat solver over that, and from that you can build an interpolant using this algorithm. Okay, so in fact, the first step is to produce a resolution proof of unsatisfiability of A and B. Okay, well, the general algorithm of, inter of interpolation by Pudlak here has a second step, which is unrelevant, uh, not relevant for the Boolean case. So when you have, uh, you have something more sophisticated, like for instance, finding interpolation for uh, SMT, we'll have one more step here, which I don't discuss here, of course. Then, okay, so a resolution proof of satisfiability, this means that you have leaves and then a set of applications of resolution inference until folds, okay? Now, of those leaves, some of the leaves will be belong to A, some of the leaves will belong to B, okay? So what you do here, you build a sort of pseudo-resolution proof whose final root will be the interpolant, which mimics the original resolution and works as follows. For a, you start from the leaves, and for every leaf, every leaf close, C, where you define the the pseudo interpolant C of C as the projection of the C to B if C is a formula from A. So if C is a close from A, so they can be either from A or B. If C was a close, is the leaf close was came from A, then you take all the lead, the, the projection over B. So all the, the literal, only the disjunction of the literal, which, uh, which are common with B, okay? Substantially is the part of the clause, which is of, rel which is of any relevance with respect to uh, the variables in B, okay? If uh, instead the clause belongs to, uh, to B, then you just take it through. Okay. Well, the intuition here is that 
substantia, you are trying to take the relevant part, the part of A, which is relevant with respect to the common variable, and to try to build that so that uh, you, you match A. Since uh, in resolving the relevant part, the only part which could be resolved against the clauses with B was, of course, the projection over B, you take, you take it, you take the projection over B. Okay, once you have written all the, the leaves, what you do is the following. In order to build the intermediate nodes, you proceed as follows. So consider an inner node in, in the resolution proof. Well, any inner node was, was obtained by resolving two clauses, let's call them C1 and C2. We will have a resolvent P and not P, okay? So they will be in the form P or some phi one and not p or some phi two. Okay, so this is the resolution. Now, again, in order to, to, to build the, the partial interpolant of that, that node, you work as follows. So if p does not occur, so either p is a variable in p or it's not a common variable or not. Okay. If it occurs in P, it, it does not occur in P, then you take uh, the um, uh, you take the disjunction of uh, the interpolant really, which, which you have previously computed with the C1 and C2. So you take the disjunction of that. If I instead, if P was part is a common variable then you take the conjunction of them. So you build recursively this, starting from the leaf down to the root, okay, applying, looking every time at the transform, at the, at the, the resolution step that just called the inference of the intermediate clause and applying either the or or the end of the respective interpolus depending on whether P is in, of course in B is a common variable or not. Okay? So is a B variable or not, sorry. Okay? At the end of this process, you will have generated also a node for the root node. Well, that root node will exactly the final interpolant. I have to say there are, there exist strategies by which to improve uh, this technique. Let me see and show you an example. Suppose you have these two formula here, sorry, which is described as written here, uh, and B. Uh, well, B variables are, are those occurring in B, A variables are those occurring only in, in A, okay? So the common variable are, are the red variables in B, okay? Now, suppose you have the conjunction of these two formula and uh, you can build a, a resolution. You can easily see that you can build a resolution proof out of this formula, okay? Where those clauses are, all the leaves, leave clauses here are part either of A or B. Okay, at the end, or after applying this resolution proof, you end up with false. Okay. Uh, so this is, for instance, the resolution proof returned by a sub solver. Okay, now, now we have this resolution proof and we try to, we build our interpolant. Okay, let's take the first clo leaf clause. Well, first we have to rewrite the leaf clauses. Leaf clause, remember, if the leaf clause uh, belonged to the formula A, then you took it, we took its projection to B. Otherwise, you, it, we use uh, we to take uh, uh, true. Well, okay, here this belongs to A, yes. Okay, so we substitute with this projection, which is the B part. So B3 or not B4. This node here 
Well, this instead belongs to uh, B. Okay, so we substitute with true. Okay. Ah, by the way, what happens if a clause be belongs to what? To both. So if we, if the two formula A and B have some clause in common, well, the result is you can consider them in another way because if uh, you have a shared uh, clause, this means that you can have a resolution proof considering either considering it part of A or, or consider this part of a, B indifferently. Okay, so this means that you can use consider them either as if they were part of A or if they were part of B. Okay, so if we we had this resolution, but this resolution was computed on B. Okay, this was computed on B3. Uh, B3, remember, is an element uh, of, uh, um, is a curse in B. So what we do is to apply, uh, is, is uh, we apply the, uh, the, conjun yes, the conjunction of the two formula, okay? We apply the conjunction of the two partial interpolants. So, since this was obtained by resolving on a B variable, a variable, uh, a common variable, then we take the conjunction of these two formula. Well, and in fact, the conjunction with true is, is the same as here. Well, making a conjunction with, with the formula, of course, this is uh, obviously true. Uh, notice that uh, when you conjoin uh, a, a clause coming from A with a clause coming from B, this is true, this will map you to true. But now, since the resolution, of course, will be done on a variable on B, okay, because this does not contain, contains only variable B, then this means that automatically we have to play the end here. So it's not surprising because the end with true is always, so this means see, typically we move back this clause here. Similarly here, this clause here belongs to B. Where is it? Uh, it's here. Okay. So it was mapped into true. So again, the, the resolution was performed on a B3 variable here. Uh, sorry, before was uh, uh, before variable, not B3. So, yeah, however, it's still B. So, this is the form of B3 variable here. So, this means that we can apply the end. The end with true, we just take this and it moves down here. Now, uh, this clause here uh, instead uh, was still, uh, well, was in A again. Here, okay, and this resolution was based on a one, but uh, uh, on uh, uh, what? Well, yes, this was performed on variable a one. Okay, yes. So uh, we uh, with variable which is not not the ah yes of course. Since uh, uh, this is uh, a variable which does not belong to uh, to B, then we perform the the uh, or of the two interpolants. Okay, and in fact we make the, the uh, here uh, we make the or of this interpolant with this interpolant we have the tend B one and not B three or B four. Again, here, next step here, again, if this is purely B with uh, it means that it's mapping to true. We have uh, now that this was obtained by resolving on B1. So we take the end as usual. So we just move down here. Last, well, second last step uh, here, this is an A formula, okay? So this was projected on B2, uh, of not B2. Uh, this was re uh, used by resolving on uh, B2, which belongs to B. 
So we take the conjunction of these two formula, of these two interpolants. So we take this interpolant and this other term, this other one, which means that we have the, this conjunction of this clause with this other clause. Finally, okay, this is a unit clause here, and this belongs to A. But belonging to A, this projection is false. Remember that the empty clause is false, is equivalent to false, right? So, false. Now, but since it's only false, then obviously the resolution was necessary. Well, since this contained only variables which didn't contain any, any uh, B variable, this means that obviously this was obtained by resolution with, uh, against, uh, uh, on, on a variable which was not there. So what you have to do is a disjunction and not surprising because you are, since you have a force, you're, the only way of not having force is having a disjunction of force with something else. So you have force or something else, you have the something else. And at the end of the day, you have the interpolant. Is this an interpolant? Well, let's see the various condition. Well, obviously, it, the symbols belong, uh, are, share, are, the, are uh, part of the shared, are all on the Bs, which are the shared variables. So condition three is this right. Can, does A entail uh, uh, this interpolant? Uh, uh, yes, because, let's see, not B2 here, well, A2. So if you, if, if you resolve these two guys together, you have not B2, yes. And if you resolve this uh, with, uh, well, this with the not B2, okay, so you have not B1 uh, here. So you resolve uh, against uh, this and you have uh, uh, B1, uh, not A2, not B3, and uh, not B4. But then you resolve this A not A2 with this A2 and you also infer this, this. So you see that this is entailed by, uh, this is entailed by A. Uh, does this, uh, uh, is inconsistent, does uh, the interpolant and B is in, uh, are together inconsistent? I would say yes, because not B2 causes the unipropagation of not B1 here, okay? Not B1 cause the unit propagation of B3 here, and not B3 cause the unit propagation of B4 here. So overall, uh, you unit propagate not B1, B3, and uh, uh, and B4, which are actually those which make this clause false. Okay, so this is indeed an interval. Okay, what is the general intuition out of that, right? So, uh, well, this algorithm has a very complicated proof um, by induction, uh, whatever, but just to give you the course idea behind that. Uh, so, substantially, since you are taking a sort of projection of uh, A into the variable, the common variables of B, it's quite natural here that you use the projection of uh, the, when you have a, an A close, uh, you, uh, so you want, you want to take the part of the, the clause which may potentially have any, any relevance in, a, a, uh, in the, um, in the, uh, what to say, uh, resolution proof of, uh, uh, of false. So for instance, if you uh, notice that if you uh, drop all the A's from those formula, uh, you still, well, obviously you still, uh, you are still able to entail uh, false. Okay. So, and every time, remember that substantially a resolution proof, corresponds to take the end of the two clauses, okay? 
is the end of the two clauses. And uh, so if you write the two, two clauses which, uh, uh, which resolve, uh, okay, so take this, okay? So if that's the end of those two guys here, uh, you notice that you, you uh, and simplify, remember that either B1 can be true or B1 can be, can be false. The resolving can either be true or be false. You obtain this. So from the end, so substantially is something that you deduce from the end of two conjunction, which is actually what you do here. So when you have uh, something which is relevant for B, you, you use something which is relevant, you resolve on a variable which is relevant for B, you use uh, the end. Otherwise, it uses the disjunction. Okay, is this reasonably three, uh, clear? <laughs> Probably not the easiest part that, uh, uh, that we have seen, but you, you see this algorithm is quite deterministic, right? Once you have uh, one, uh, once you have the proof, it's very, very straightforward to get to, to get the interpolant. All right? Hello? So, do you have any question about this algorithm? Mm, I don't think so. I just have to watch it uh, more clearly, but I yeah. think... I mean, it's... this is quite... Uh, once you, you read it, understand every step, this is quite immediate to do, right? This is uh, something that you really, it really doesn't take much to, to you to, to solve. Okay, so think at about least, that. Uh, at least to me, the algorithm is uh, really clear. It's still uh, rather foggy why we have to take the disjunction when we are uh, talking about the resolution about a variable in A, but well, kind there of is a very complicated. Since, uh, well, there is a very complicated proof of that. Yeah. Yes, I and guess. And it's not so intuitive. The, so the, the proof is based on some uh, finding some invariant properties uh, of this uh, of this intermediate partial. They call the partial interpolants. Okay. Uh, I, I just in order to understand what interpolant is, I think that's probably the best way is a think in terms of uh, not B rather than not B. Okay? Which, by the way, was the original uh, formulation of, of Craig. But uh, since we are SAT people, and we are, when uh, we want to represent an, implement, uh, an implication, we represent this as uh, the end of, uh, of the implicant. So, when we have to prove an, impl implement, um, an implication, so an entailment in a SAT, uh, so we want to prove um, A entails B, what we do is try to, to find that A and not B is a SAT, right? Okay, so this is uh, written as a SAT, uh, what, but the original information is written as an uh, entailment. And uh, maybe this notion of entailment is uh, better, is clear, to, Clear to understand the meaning. If we have that A entails, if you have that A entails not B, okay, and then we find something intermediate from A and not B, such that A entails I, I entails not B. So you see that this is intermediate in the chain of entailment, right? And I is restricted to the common symbols of B. Okay, notice that at the end of the day, in order to have this unsat, there will be some projection of A here on the variables of B, which will make all the possible candidate models of B false. Okay, so, a will entail something on the variables of B such that this something makes all the possible candidate models of B uh, inconsistent, okay? Or if you prefer, if you prefer, A entails something 
which makes, uh, which falsifies all the possible candidate models of P, right? Okay, I is exactly this something. You want to understand what is this something, which is entailed by B, which makes all the candidate model of B, which violates all the candidate models of B. Okay, this is the role of the of the I of the entire point. And why is this interesting? Because this uh, this is built on a much 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 less variable typically. Okay. So, so that's more or less all. Any question left? Any question, guys? Oh, maybe just one last question. Yes. About the constraints of the inter of the interpolation, the third one is yes. uh, not given for free sorry the third uh, constraint is not given for free after all why because uh, we because uh, a b is an ordered pair so the relation of uh, all all variables of uh, one is are contained in the other is uh, no, granted no, no, no. In notice that uh, uh, b can contain variables not only a can contain variables which are not in b okay. but also b can contain variables which are not in a okay okay well the typical use is that uh, let me make the typical use we have in practice is that uh, uh, a has much much more variables than b let me say typical use but this the definition has nothing to do with this hypothesis. Okay, the practical use, the practical reason why this is used is that uh, you want to project A on uh, a much, much uh, shorter list of variables, those which have a role in making B false. So A is, so the idea of that, again, I repeat, uh, the idea when you have that A and B is unsatisfiable, okay? This means that there, there must be some collision of values between the common variables, right? Because of course, if A is satisfiable and B, ah, I, uh, I forgot to say, in practice, we implicitly assume that A and B alone are satisfiable, okay? This is not necessarily the case uh, and the interpolant works uh, anyway, but of practical use, uh, the cases where uh, the, the meaning of an uh, interpolant has any meaning is the case where singularly A and B are satisfied, okay? Although the formal definition does not require that, okay? So the idea is what are I want to find something which is uh, derived from B on the variable, some constraints, or the set of constraints on the variables of, on A, which are derivable from A on the common variable, which prevent, which uh, eliminate one by one all the candidate, possible candidate models of B. So I cuts away is the part of A which is, in, is a part which entailed by A, which cuts all the models of B. Okay. Okay, uh, I'll, I will think about it but, uh, later on. Okay, notice that these interpolants, uh, I think many of you come from the formal verification community, right? Right? Okay, this is very important. The notion of interpolant is very, very important in informal verification. It's used, uh, thanks to the work of Macmillan and other people, uh, the notion of interpolant is very, very important in formal verification. Okay, so if there is no other work left, nothing uh, no, left. Uh, sorry, 
Oh, yeah, yeah. I please. have a question uh, if you can. Yeah, sure, sure. So, would it be. For you? For you? Gianluca Redondi, sir. Okay, yeah, okay. Would it be not uh, useful to just. Um, so, to, to have uh, the interpolant? Uh, just uh, remove uh, an, the atom, uh, an atom which is not common, and add uh, at a, as a disjunction the same formula when you substitute the this not common atom with the uh, true and false. Mm, sorry, so, sorry. Uh, I, I fail to understand what you are proposing. Sorry. So to create the interpolant between what between a uh, formula between a and B. Sorry between A and B. Yeah, okay, conjunctive, okay, yes. Could you just take A and B and substitute a non-common atom mm -hmm. with uh, true and then add the disjunction or A and B substituting with? Well, non-common atoms can occur either positively or negatively. Yes, you had the disjunction of the two cases. And sorry, and that what? And, and that what? As a disjunction, you had the uh, the same formula substituting with further for, with true in the first case and false in the, in the second case. So you add a or not a, but a or not a is a valid formula. So it does. It adds nothing. No, no, you take A and B yeah. and say P is a, a non common atom. Yeah. So to, to construct the interpolant, you uh, apply um, inductively, recursively, I mean, the substitution A and B and you substitute P with true, or A and B and you substitute P with false. And you do this until you, uh, all non-common atoms are... Oh, uh, yeah, no, I understand what you mean. Substantially, you are saying you are existentially quantified away the non-common variables. Yes, exactly, yes, yes. Okay, okay. no, good. Okay, good observation, yes. Uh, my answer is uh, yes, but this would be using a cannon to, to shoot a fly, to say... In the sense that uh, existential quantification tends to cause a blow up in size, okay, an exponential blow up in size. Well, okay, let me clarify what uh, your uh, uh, your friend has. Uh, yeah, sorry uh, if I wasn't here. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, what you could do? Well, there is one obvious candidate uh, for uh, um, as interpolation, which is. Uh, exist so if a1 uh, ak are so let's call x okay if x1 uh, xk are the variables in a which are not in b you can uh, existentially quantify out x1 x2 x3 sk over a so they compute the boolean formula corresponding to uh, exist x1, x6, x2, x6, x3, blah, 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 exist xn. Okay. This, of course, will, is logically, um, will, uh, uh, is, uh, the, is an interpolant because well, it, it entails the, uh, it, it is entailed, of course, by the, uh, the original formula. It still verifies B and uh, is, it contains only the relevant value. Actually, this is the strongest possible interpolant. It, it can be proved that, that uh, the existential quantification, if you take A and uh, you existentially quantify out uh, all uh, the uh, proper variables, so the, the personal variables, then what you obtain is the strongest possible interpolant. The answer is definitely yes, you can, but this would be much more computationally much more challenging than a computing interpolant. Because uh, in order to compute existential quantification, it typically blows up in size. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. But uh, however, this was a perfectly meaningful question. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, guys, see you on Monday. Thank you very much, everybody.
Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye